Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Sanafik Birara, and I am the Programs Director with Your Ethiopian Professionals, most commonly known as YUP. YUP has been trying to play an active role in light of COVID-19 or the coronavirus pandemic to disseminate actual and timely information to our community. And we've also been hosting live Q&A sessions um, with healthcare professionals that are well-versed in everything that's going on. Um, in, <coughs> excuse me, um, accordingly, we have, this is going to be our third iteration of hopefully many more to come. Um, before I introduce our special guest, Dr. Zion, I'm just going to communicate a few disclaimers. First off, this um, Q&A is going to be in English. If there are any questions that you would like us to address in Amharic, we'll be sure to do so later. Um, and if you haven't done so already, I invite you to watch the Q&As that we've hosted last week with Dr. Moti and Dr. Abi in Amharic. We're trying to ensure that there's a variety in terms of the items that we're putting out. Um, that includes languages as well. And second of all, Dr. Tsion is here, not representing representing any institution that she's a part of, um, but really trying to give us collective information based on her expertise. So any advice or guidance that she gives today is going to be for the collective. I know that the need um, to have access, direct access to healthcare workers hasn't been greater, but um, unfortunately, based on the medium that we have now, she won't be able to give any specific medical consultation. So anytime that you ask a question, please structure your questions accordingly. Um, Dr. Zion, thank you for joining us today. I know you are no stranger to YAP, but I will give you the floor to speak a little bit about you and what you do. Okay, thanks so much, Sanafik, and uh, thank you so much, YAP, for having me back again. I've been a YEP member for a very long time and last April um, also joined us a panelist live. I guess times have changed and we have to do things remotely. So just like Sanafik said, uh, my name is Zion Fereo. Um, I do work clinically as an emergency physician in New York City as an emergency doctor and as an attending. I also have an appointment at the medical school at Columbia University as an assistant professor. And the other um, part, I do work at the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia as an advisor. I've been at the ministry for the past almost uh, five years now. As initially I started as a volunteer and I joined as a technical advisor. And as of almost two years ago, I joined the ministry office as an advisor to the minister as a, on strategy partnership on emergency care. So uh, that's me in a nutshell and I do split my time between New York and Addis Ababa, especially in the past two years. I have been going there almost every 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 four or five weeks um, and spend time there um, in person. And when I'm not there, oh. I do split my time also working at the ministry. Most of it is working on different um, strategies and development of um, programs and um, strengthening the whole emergency care. It's not only the public health emergency or outbreaks, but the day-to-day -day emergencies that people face as an individual and also working on strengthening the health system. So um, that's about it. Great, thank you so, so much. Um, before we get started with our Q&A, this is how we're going to be structuring our conversation. We're going to be spending the next 30 to 40 minutes um, going through pre-prepared pre questions with um, Zion, and then we're going to leave um, about 20 to 30 minutes for a live Q&A. So if you are looking at this on our social media platforms, please be sure to um, submit in your questions, and then we have a team that's monitoring it. Um, if we don't have to address, if we don't have time to address it today, we'll work very hard to ensure that you get a response later on. But we do have an hour today, and we'll you know try to keep it at that. Um, so before um, we dive into the questions, I think it wouldn't be fair for the first question to be anything other than how are you doing? I'm 
emergency <laughs> medicine is a, is a beast, um, especially at a time of a pandemic, but you've been very candid in terms of everything that's been going on the past couple of weeks. You shared, I think about a week or two ago that you even had to be quarantined for a while because of high risk exposure. So how are you doing and what are you doing to cope emotionally, physically, mentally? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, as of um, last week, actually on Thursday, I mean, it's very difficult. It's um, emergency departments during this flu season in general, during the winter month, we are um, at a higher maximum capacity. The hospitals are usually on surge and working, especially in a place like New York City, where um, where the hospitals at baseline levels are constrained. It's a bit difficult um, to usually the winter months are our worst months when it comes to capacity. So um, I think like most people, I would say we didn't, I didn't think also personally that um, we were gonna be hit this to this much in New York. Um, I knew it was going to eventually come, it was inevitable, but um, unfortunately in the US as you guys have seen it, uh, we're underprepared. So I think the under preparation has been um, a bit frustrating. And this is something not only at a hospital level, but it's also as a country level, as a policy makers. So that's been difficult. Um, and I think um, the emergency medicine mantra is that, you know, um, hope for the best and prepare for the worst and remain unsurprised by what happens in the middle. Um, and I think it's my favorite saying um, from my angel. And it's been, I'm not gonna lie, it's been difficult. Um, it's something that we've been trained for and this is something, the resiliency I guess in humanity and specifically in, um, in emergency medicine is it's impeccable. Uh, but one of the hardest part I would say is um, seeing my own colleagues getting sick um, because of this disease or um, out of the emergency department. And last every day, things change. The difficult part is having to um, adjust to the change and at the same time, um, make sure that you're up to date with the most recent information with the most recent evidence. So in that way you can apply it to your, your patients. Um, so the ever-changing um, dynamics of the disease and the pandemic itself is but challenging. So the added challenge to what we see every day. Um, and also um, the concern with my colleagues. Um, you know, I am I'm one of the two, the few uh, people to say that a, you know, not having a medical illness, uh, comorbidity or um, other risk factors for this disease and being relatively young, younger uh, than most of my other colleagues. I think in a way I am um, low, quote unquote, low risk. But again, that changed too, right? Because what we've seen in China, the highest fatality rate happened, um, occurred uh, on people over the age of 70, 75 and uh, people in their 20s, 30s, uh, they get usually the milder form of the disease. But what we're seeing when to when it comes to Italy and Europe, the the disease process and the epidemiology is changing. So again, we can't anchor on the first data set that was released from China and that evolves. So um, the everyday challenge with having to um, having to catch up with the new information. I think those are the new added challenge. But other than that, um, I'm very, I'm one of those people who are very, very proud along with my other colleagues to be in this field. We're on the same mindset. We're the gatekeepers of the hospitals. Um, and to not to sound like we're bragging, but I think we're used to this and that's why we train for this. But I think it's when it's over the capacity, the patients are coming, but you look to the left, you look to the right. You, there are more, there are less and less health providers because people are come are leave, are, you know, having to be on home stay on home quarantine. And your question to me being quarantined or home isolation um, was again uh, a change. Initially, our criteria were for travel history to 
at that point to the five countries that were high risk and also people that have been in contact with um, known COVID patient or the COVID, uh, the coronavirus that well, we're all talking. There are different strains of corona, so I don't, that's why I'm not saying corona. The name for this pandemic is COVID-19. So um, at that point, you know, we had our guards up for the people that were higher risk by the definition of the CDC and by the Department of Health. And based on those guidelines that I followed, um, the patients that I was exposed to didn't meet any of the criteria. The next day or two days afterwards, once um, after my exposure, the criteria has changed. So that's how rapid, how rapidly things are changing. So um, for me, it was very upsetting for two reasons. <laughs> A, um, um, you know, I did like part of the things I did, you know, follow all the procedures and the rules that were there at the time. I kind of was upset to be the guinea pig in a way because I was asymptomatic, but the rules were that every physician that's been exposed without having the proper equipment has to be on isolation. And for those of me that know me personally, uh, I'm, not, I'm not kind of the homebound person. I, if I stay at home for more than a few hours, I just get a headache and I'm constantly on the move. So it was a bit of an adjustment, but I kept myself busy, not on purpose, but also because the job for the work that I do in Ethiopia kept me busy. And I have um, also, you know, um, amounts amounts of uh, help and support from everyone that's been keeping me busy checking on me so that helped and also the other upsetting part was uh, I was told about my exposure two days before I was supposed to fly out to Ethiopia for my work there so broke my heart that I couldn't be there uh, at that point the new minister was getting appointed so I wanted to be there for that and also the situations in Ethiopia were changing um, at that point that was the week that we had identified the first case and all those things. So um, I guess I've answered most of your questions, but um, and, and you know the short answer is it's, it's difficult, but I think it's something that uh, we're learning and having uh, the support around has been very, very helpful. The community from everyone, from my family, my husband, my friends, all those things uh, made it very, very, um, has made it a lot easier and uh, but yeah so and then the big thing is about staying humble because what you said will be what's right today will be changed tomorrow so really uh, staying teachable and humble is one of the things that I am continuing to do to survive this through all this pandemic. I think I speak for many when I say thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, Barack Obama recently had uh, a really lovely quote about owing a debt of gratitude to healthcare workers and really everybody who's at the forefront of this fight and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. In your opinion, what can people like me, I'm not a healthcare worker, I'm not actively involved in this fight, how can we model our behavior after you all to help one another through this? Um. So I'm thinking that a lot of the audience that we might have here are people of Ethiopian or Eritrean descent and also um, people that are through quote unquote the diaspora, it's not my favorite word, but I would have to use it. Uh, and uh, people that are privileged in a way. If you do have the opportunity to get online, get on the computer and watch this, you're one of the few people who are privileged for one or the other. You have access to internet, you have access to information. You also have access to um, people like me and lots of other people. So two things I would say very, very important, actually three things. Stay informed. Staying informed and getting information from the right people and the right resources. Whatever state or country you might be in, there's a Department of Health, there's a CDC, there's some health officials who are probably sending out messages every day. Do stay informed. The second thing is most of you guys, uh, because I know this is your Ethiopian professional, but it used to be young. So I'm gonna probably just make a generalized statement here. The younger, quote unquote, the younger population, um, less than 35, 40, it's arguable, right? Um, you are a much decreased rate of dying from this, I mean, a risk, decreased risk of dying from this disease uh, than your parents 
older than your grandparents. So a few things that you can do is do take your part in staying home and listening to the advices of the healthcare professionals. I just saw a quote that um, the Ellen Show posted, which said, you, uh, you, your parents and your grandparents were sent to the war. You were being asked to stay on the couch, so please do it. So I think that is one thing that we should be taking. The third thing is, um, I think being in, um, in a country here, again, and having information, you also will be talking to your family in Ethiopia or your family here, right? So once you acquire the right information from the right people, disseminating that information to your family members, whether it's here or in Ethiopia, and with that information, it's very important to ensure them not to panic because panic and rumors do spread faster than COVID-19, okay? And just like what Dr. Tedro said, infodemic is what's gonna kill people more than the pandemic. But if we do spread the right information and the right measures that need to be taken, we can control this pandemic. So those are the three things that you can do. And then I've learned actually in the past few weeks and few months, more than the healthcare professionals or as much as the healthcare professionals, the role of media and technology. That is something that we tend to oversee, but people do acquire information from online sources. People do get information from colleagues, from friends, from Twitter, from Instagram. So the way you disseminate this information and the way, um, and the actual facts that you do share really matter. So those are the things. And the simple interventions out of the three things are disseminating information such as about washing your hands, not touching your face, staying at home. Those will be what would save this. If there's no vaccine yet, until we get that, we can't promote vaccines. But those are the three things that you can do to save yourself from the disease and then from spreading it to your family members. And I would say the young, the millennials, you guys are the vehicle of the spread of this disease. Asymptomatic millennials have been the cause of the spread of the disease in Italy and Spain. But the reason that most of the people who are over the age of 50 are going to the hospitals because of the exposure from the younger population. So please, 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 this is so important that you do take that responsibility and share with your family members. So that would be uh, what I would want to focus on. Okay. So give us a picture of what the emergency room that you work at looks like right now. Uh, how many COVID-19 cases or suspected cases would you say you've seen? How are the patients doing right now? Similar to everything or most things that we're reading, is it only folks with pre-existing conditions um, who are older, who have compromised immune systems that are getting um, the worst end of it in terms of symptoms, or are you seeing things a little bit differently? Kind of give us a viewpoint of what your world looks like, your work world. Okay. So I would say, um, you know, I don't have ad aggregated data. Most of it would be anecdotal from my own experience and from what uh, one of the things about this um, there's like different in a way support groups that are there either for you know informational for disseminating the right information so within our uh, department and within the city and uh, friends from residency so there's like a group of um, some information source either through whatsapp or through telegram so um, you know i'm getting information from my colleagues in washington state or in california so what, I'll be, what I'm gonna tell you uh, right now is not something that's published, especially anecdotal and things do change. So I spent six days at home during, after my exposure, I was supposed to be on home um, isolation quarantine for like 14 days, but the Department of Health changed that rule in the CDC. Once they said, um, we have, we're getting a lot of people exposed either in the community or the hospital. So they changed the rules because they couldn't keep up with all the healthcare professionals out of the hospital. So if you're asymptomatic, do not have a fever, please get back to work. So during those six days, I'll give you an example. The day before I was quarantined, the patients that I saw that were 
COVID suspect cases were two on average on eight hour shift or 10, 12 hour shifts. Um, between me and the physician assistants, I might see three to six patients an hour. So that day, um, I would say maybe we had three patients in the entire eight hour for COVID suspect, right? Because either they've traveled, they have contact. And then the New York City, if you guys remember from the first case that we had in New York City was a man who with no travel history, but uh, has gone to, um, has works at, as a lawyer in Manhattan and also lives in the area called Westchester. And um, he had gone to, and his kid and his, um, neighbor so he infected a couple of people so his cluster were being observed and monitored so um, right after that case so whoever has been from that area would be highly vigilant of testing for those patients if they're symptomatic right so outside of that area people and then the no travel history people did not meet the criteria so the people that we've tested were either with those risk factors or with known exposure to COVID-19 so that week, I only saw, that day specifically, I only had three suspect cases. And none of them, um, I, I did not think they would be positive because they were low risk, right? So I think out of the three that I've seen, one came back positive. I go back to work seven days later. Um, out of my entire eight hour shift, I would say we had um, maybe between eight to 15, I myself had eight rule outs and my other colleague had maybe another seven or eight and most of them tested positive. And the ones that we saw that day in the emergency department were young, not a lot of comorbidities, but had either pneumonia or other shortness of breath or their oxygenation was really good. So that's the reason we had to test them. So the New York rule right now is that they're not being hospitalized, you don't test, you don't test for the COVID either have them follow up with their doctor or as an outpatient. So you can see how the number has actually quadrupled, right? The suspect case that had mean is the divisional interaction. And um, I'm not quite sure exactly the hospital number, but we also have had several deaths in our ICUs, but most of them are elderly patients over the age of 70 and 80. I'll tell you that that's my personal experience, but my other colleagues from within the same hospital and other hospitals, they've had to intubate meaning the patients that they saw couldn't breathe on their own or their the pneumonia was really bad the patients could not breathe on their own so they had to put them on a ventilator and some of these patients most of them are of course elderly with comorbidities but we're seeing also younger patients who are young and healthy no other comorbidities who are needing increased uh, care meaning increased higher level care so Again, the numbers do change. We it's changing a lot more than China and than Europe, and you know this is not something that has been studied yet. But my own theory is, compared to U.S., compared to Europe, U.S. do have um, less healthier lifestyle. So the younger patients, because of also obesity and smoking and all the bad behaviors um, that they do. It's going to put them at an increased risk. And I think that number is going to change in, Europe, in the U.S. compared to Europe. But we're going to find out in the next few weeks. So it's very early to say to do things are evolving. But as of now, I would say uh, you and this is shown like 20 percent of the patients that we're seeing here who are needing ICU level care are between the ages of 20 to 64 which is a lot less of an age for what, we see, what we've been seeing in Europe and in China. And this numbers might change tomorrow, but I think it's very important that to think that the young, um, the young and the um, ones with no other comorbidities, we're not invincible anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we have to think about moving forward. Not only are we the vehicles of the spread of the disease, but we might not be as immune as we thought we were from the data from Europe and from, um, from China. Let's talk a little bit about um, the symptoms. And this is something that we've addressed with our previous um, physicians that we've hosted as well. There's a lot of information that's out there, um, especially in light of it being 
the flu season. A lot of people are also developing allergies and colds. And, and I know we have a few people that are asking about symptoms right now, but from, you know, your personal experience and what you're seeing, um, what your colleagues are seeing, what would you say are um, the most telling symptoms of COVID-19? Okay. So, so far what we've seen and what the data has shown from other countries, the most common presenting symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, body aches, uh, sore throat, and for some headaches. Um, so most of the patients would have one or two or all of the symptoms. And of course, the concerning would be when they start having shortness of breath. That is when you would have to check if they're developing pneumonia or, okay, people are texting me saying, speak a little louder. Okay, how about that? Maybe I'll wear my other headphones. I'm getting, I'm getting a text message from my nieces and nephews, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think we're um, fine for now, but we can we can monitor. Okay, okay. So um, the symptoms again, uh, they might people are not going to read the textbooks before coming or the internet data. So people present different symptoms. So the concerning symptoms would be the shortness of breath, and of course, more concerning if patients have uh, what we call other comorbidities such as emphysema or um, other lung issues um, or what we call COPD. And mostly, for example, here in New York, if you don't have a fever and you only have a cough, you're less likely to get tested. Even us as a physicians, when we're on self-monitoring, we are told to check our fever, uh, our temperature to see if we have a fever. Um, just with allergy seasons, runny nose and itching is not really going to be the only presenting symptom most of the time. We can never say never in this. We're all learning through this process. And I think it's very important that uh, people do get the right information again. Uh, but at this point, the community spread and places like New York, California, and Washington are rampant. Healthcare workers, people that are exposed, are going to have an increased risk factor, just like we talked about earlier. So those are the things to look out to. And... Um, if you think you do have COVID and you don't have any comorbidities, the best thing that you can do, especially if you're in places like New York, California, or Washington, is to stay at home. That will really help uh, with the other patients that need it. There's some drive-through uh, places that have offered testing, and New York is one of that. So if you don't need to be in the ER or in the emergency department, please don't go to the emergency department. That's just going to be my public service announcement because we are seeing people that are the, what we call the worried well. They're so worried that they might have it. And let's say we have a kit where we test you, it's positive. We're not going to do anything different. The same thing like when you have the flu or cold symptoms, unless you do need hospitalization, which are based on the other things that I talked about earlier, I think the best thing you can do is stay at home and, um, avoid contacting other people and congregating and also taking the necessary precautions at home. I want to expand on that a little bit and you've already addressed this, but at this point, who should be seeking care? Um, there's a lot of paranoia, a lot of anxiety for somebody who's at home, who's starting to develop some symptoms. You mentioned earlier, I think right now the guidelines are if your symptoms are not that drastic, isolate, you know, don't come to the urgent care, don't come to the emergency room. But I think what point would you say is, is critical enough? Because even shortness of breath can be very subjective, right? Especially when it's intensified with paranoia. What point would you say it's absolutely critical one way or another to seek care? Okay, I would put it like a syllabus test. Imagine this was before COVID-19 or before this pandemic. You've all had colds, you'll have had the flu at some point in your life. Um, if you don't, you are so lucky. <laughs> but so imagine when you have that cold with cough, uh, with some fever and some body aches. What are the chances that you go to the emergency department to get it checked? So that should be your um, way of um, deciding whether to go or not. Imagine this was not the pandemic 
and it was just any other regular flu season, how often do you go to the emergency department for it? Of course, if you are um, a patient with comorbidities, comorbidities meaning if you have existing conditions such as um, COPD, emphysema, severe asthma, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, all those things. And specifically also in what we call immunocompromised patients, patients who are cancer, uh, who have cancer and taking immunomodulators or immunosuppressants, if your immune system is not as strong. And uh, patients who also have immunocompromised patients around. So I would say if you don't fit any of these categories, um, Again, there's no reason for you to go to the emergency department. And it's very important to check your regulations or your guidelines for your state. I'm talking about what's in New York. In New York, if you're young and healthy, coming with fever, cough, and sore throat, we're most likely not gonna test you. But we do have the drive-through the drive through test and the telemedicine, which are offered in several hospitals. So if you just want to know for of the sake of having it or not, then you can get tested here. When you feel like you're short of breath, meaning you're walking from one room to another, which is the only thing you should be doing if you're feeling sick, and you feel like you have to catch your breath and even to talk, you're not finishing your usual sentences, those would be a good sign that you probably need to go to the emergency department. Um, again, um, what I would want to reiterate is that just think of it like, you know, before the COVID and then the pandemic, if you are likely to go to the emergency department for that symptom that you have, then go. If you don't, then don't go. So that should be the general rule when to decide. I would say also parents um, over the age of 60, 70, I think if they start having the symptoms, probably would have those should have the low threshold to go especially the shortness of breath, um, but not just for the sniffles and the fever. And taking over the counter medication and see how you do with that is the first measure, taking ibuprofen and Tylenol and see if the muscle ache and the, and the fever. Usually a lot of people develop headache when they have intense fever. So when you do take the antiepileptic or the temperature reducing medications, see how your body um, reacts to it. So I think those are the first things that you can do at home and your usual over-the-counter remedies would be fine. Um, hopefully somebody can go get it for you um, so in that way you don't go to the pharmacy and spread it to everybody. But I think those are some of the few measures that you can do um, and one deciding to go to the hospital or not. And some of us are lucky enough to have primary care doctors. I can call you primary care doctor over the phone and consulting them about what you're feeling. I think that might be more helpful. Um, hopefully you don't have to decide for yourself, but most people with insurances, they should have access to a primary care doctor that you can use. So uh, do please take advantage of that before you um, go to emergency departments and have to wait four hours to be seen and either get the disease or spread the disease to others in the waiting room. That's extremely helpful. Um, in addition to healthcare workers or anybody that's in the hospital right now that's on the front lines, there are or also others who don't have the privilege of socially distancing themselves. I'm talking about essential employees that still need to get up every day and go to work. Uh, what is the best advice that you could give them in terms of protecting themselves and protecting others around them? Okay. I think having to change your daily routines, let alone during a time of pandemic, but also um, changing your habits when you're being when you're being told when you're told to do so is very difficult. Um, I would say, I mean, we've you've heard it already time and time again. Wash your hands, and when you do wash your hands with hands and soap, uh, with, with, your, with water and soap. It's very important that you do it for at least a minute or for 60 seconds. And there is a video from Dr. Tedros of him watching it, uh, washing his hands on online and you can YouTube it. So you, may, you have to make sure that you get all corners of your hand, your thumbs and between your fingers, the tip of your fingers. And ladies, you probably have long nails. So it's very, very important to wash the inside and the outside of it up to the level of your wrist. And make sure that you also wa wash your palm very, very well. Take 60 seconds. Believe me, I didn't even do this until this happened because we usually we used to wash it for 60 seconds, uh, for 20 seconds. But 60 seconds is very, very important. The second thing is to ensure that you have a hand sanitizer. 
at home. If you can't have one at home or in your pocket, there are a whole bunch of videos for do it yourself. Um, and you have to make sure it has 60% alcohol in it at least uh, to have a very, um, to have a safe and an effective hand sanitizer. So when you do hand sanitize again, 20 seconds. So 20 seconds for hand sanitizing, you make sure you get every corner of your hand and 60 seconds or one minute for washing your hands. So this is very, very important. And you've seen me, even me as a healthcare professional, right? Uh, I've touched my face several times. I think I was watching Synaphic. I think she did it only maybe two, three times, but that's good. So those are very, very difficult habits to change. Um, like the reason I even took off my glasses right now, I don't wear them as often, but I am constantly touching my glasses, constantly. I look down, I'm putting it up. So really I've become very vigilant of all those activities at home and also at work. So washing your hands, hand sanitizing, and um, trying to avoid touching your face and your mouth. Those are very, very important things. Of course, social distancing is very difficult, but if you don't have to, try to not to associate with anybody as much as you can with more than two meters of a distance. So the recommendation is six feet or two meters away from people outside or in gathering. And again, for example, even at work, I had to the other day, I was just used to going and taking my snack or my food at the break room. But then I walked in and there's like plenty of nurses and doctors in that room. I was like, no, 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 we should not be doing this anymore. And have like a set, you know, change of habit. I just wanted to sit down and eat with them. Like, this is something that we have to do also. So constantly thinking and reminding yourself, are the things that I'm doing, putting myself and other people at risk? So um, those are some of the few things that you can do. And for example, that day I had to adjust. I'm like, I can't sit down and eat right now here in front of, uh, inside the break room. I'm just gonna go to the ambulance bay and eat uh, where no one's around and maybe two other people might be standing outside. So if you don't have the advantage of social distancing, just be constantly vigilant of how far you are standing away from your colleagues or your counterparts. And what you have to be at work, just make sure you wash your hands constantly. And people always ask, how often should we wash it? I would say every time you touch your face. So, um, and several times a day. Um, at the same time, also, if you don't have access to soap or water, hand sanitizing. I'm constantly hand sanitizing my hand in between patients, after I touch my computer, after I touch my phone, every second. And then make sure you clean your, your um, using Lysol to clean your cell phones and um, all the surfaces that you touch. So those are some of the measures that you can take as an individual if you don't have the advantage of working from home. And if you're working from home and then do the other things so you won't spread the disease to others. Well, it's good to know that I've only touched my face a couple of times in the past <laughs> hour. I've definitely improved. <laughs> um, but bringing the conversation um, back to our community, um, what unique gaps would you say you witnessed in terms of our response to COVID, whether it's the diaspora that's dispersed globally or people back home in Ethiopia? Um, and to frame it a little bit differently, what would you you say you wish our community understood better in terms of disseminating information or giving guidelines? What do we need to work on and what steps can we take to work on it now? Um, so I have to be careful the way I say it so now I won't offend anybody uh, but I'm gonna be a little bit blunt because it's very important because I'm also at a fault too. Um, one thing I would say is I think the concept of social distancing, we're not understanding it very well. We, especially this millennial generation, we are so used to having our freedom. We are so used to doing to what we want and in a way getting away with it, especially in this country. And when this disease happened and when this is occurred, um, starts coming, started coming to you, the US and one of the things that really appalled me and I was very sad to see it. The amount of Habesha people promoting parties and parties where Shisha and Hookah were promoted. I would say that's the worst kind of um, ammunition that you have the capacity to spread the disease. A, you are gathering with people 
B, not only are you gathering, but you are putting the virus into the shisha. And when it comes out, aerosolizing the entire room. So I understand a lot of the bars and restaurants are closed in most of the big cities. But unfortunately, I thought when it comes to diseases, we would be a bit more careful. And it would help that also now the restaurants are closed, that you're not doing it at home next to a whole bunch of other people. At this point, I would say that whether you're here in Ethiopia, you would have to think that you either have the disease or you are at risk of the disease. So unfortunately, I think all these bad habits are something that we need to get rid of. And my every time I see on social media, people promoting and trying to take advantage of um, the Corona beer advertisements, I think for me as a healthcare professional, I find it very, um, I find it very sad. So I think hopefully we're doing better. And I would also say when it comes to concepts of social distancing, I understand that our community, especially back home is very religious. And now that it's also the fasting season, people would have to um, go to a place of worship. Um, Yesterday, as you guys have seen, the uh, press release from the ministry's, the prime minister's office and the Ministry of Health has been really trying to avoid overcrowded places. And unfortunately, that would have to include places of worship. So I think we have to be better leaders at this point. Um, either, I would, you know, for me, I would say if my mom or if my parents are, or my dad are to call me and um, any of my older aunts and uncles, my thing would say at this point, you'd have to pray from home. You'd have to avoid congregation because it is unfortunately higher risk of acquiring the disease from places like that. And I wish uh, the millennials and the younger generations took a bit of um, the leadership and advocate for such things. So in that way, their parents and their grandparents would take this advice and that you would be the better teacher for this. So at this point, especially uh, a lot of, if you've seen it, most of the other African countries have taken serious measures of banning any gathering, including at a place of worship. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be very difficult for, um, uh, you know, there's been, you know, what came out out of the press release, it's something that's suggested, but again, uh, law enforcement or there's not going to be any harsh enforcement when it comes to this. So I think it's an individual responsibility to take that advice from the Ministry of Health and the health professionals for um, at least this pandemic, at least we start seeing the flattening of the curve all over the world. And when it's time to go outside, when it's time again to congregate, people should do it then. Um, and I'm going to quote it. I'm going to quote one of my mentor who said on her tweet to said, you know, God listens also from home. Necessarily, people don't have to go to church. So there's going to be a lot of argument around this. I do understand. Um, but I think it's just this time shall pass. And the whole point is trying to make sure that it doesn't pass having killed so many people. So those little bit of sacrifice that we make as an individual, as a group is going to have the biggest outcome and benefit and impact on our society, whether here or in Ethiopia, so or in Eritrea. So do please teach your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and your grand aunts to stay home and pray at home. We need the prayers, okay? But I think it's very important that all of us do change our behaviors and our practices. Thank you for that. Um, I know we have about 15 to 20 minutes left. Thank you to everybody who's been submitting questions so far. We will do our best to address them live. And as I mentioned earlier, if we can't get to it right now, we'll be sure to give you a response on our social media platforms. I'm gonna sort of direct two questions at you and you can address them all together. Maybe spend the next couple of minutes before we move on to audience questions. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on in New York. Um, obviously, I think the stats are above 25,000 right now. They might be a little bit higher, but why do you think New York is at the worst end of it right now in the US? Is it just that aggressive testing seems to be done in the States at a higher rate than any other and that we're really looking at similar stats all across 
the board. And once you're done with that, um, you know, you've mentioned kind of your work in Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia is at 11 cases as of this morning, I believe. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts in terms of what's going on in Ethiopia, um, the response efforts thus far, and what needs to be done from a healthcare and a clinical management perspective to ensure that this is being managed. Okay, so I'll start with New York. Um, and as of three weeks ago, we had zero cases. The first confirmed case was a guy who has no travel history, was a lawyer that commutes from Westchester to Manhattan. And he came to the hospital for what at that point was a pneumonia-like picture. This is all over the news, so I'm not violating any HIPAA violation. So, um, and eventually after staying for several days, he was tested for COVID and he was positive and he was transferred to, um, to another institution within the network. So, the tracing around of all the places that he's been to, his neighbor, his friends, his, um, this is place of worship. All those places were checked and traced and his son's school, his son was also, I believe he tested positive and the school that he attended um, were also closed. So this is really about the public health intervention is about containment, testing, and also making sure that the, you identify the clusters from spreading. So before we know it though, of course, once we found out the patient has not traveled and did have a known exposure to a COVID-19 patient, that is an evidence of a community spread. It means the spread in the community and we haven't detected it. So that's what we felt, I think, as a nation in the US, um, we failed at detection, we failed at testing. And there are a lot of things that we're filling out right now to New York, like not providing, not having the right amount of personal protective equipment or what we call PPE for our healthcare providers. Because right now the healthcare providers because of lack of PPEs um, are not, and also because of lack of testing are not, um, are not covered or are not protected from, this, from getting this disease. So we're seeing more and more of the healthcare professionals starting from my department where some of my colleagues had to be on, uh, on quarantine because of uh, they tested positive for COVID. So three weeks ago, we had zero cases. Uh, a week ago, we had around, I would say 4,000 or so cases. Uh, yesterday, I think was around 13,000 cases, and today I woke up to a case of 22,000. And this is all of the state, it's not only New York City. And as you've seen, we've been playing catch up. As of 8 p.m. today, in about 10 minutes, the city is gonna shut down. It's only gonna be open for groceries, for healthcare professionals, and all quote unquote essential. So on the only thing that will be open are hospitals, groceries, and pharmacies. That was the announcement that the mayor made, um, the government made. The mayor has been trying to push this a lot earlier, but eventually, you know, people were told to stay at home, work from home, but unfortunately people not, did not take that advice. So that took a while. Um, and even with this lockdown, you have to understand that the number of cases are gonna keep on going up exponentially because tomorrow I might wake up to a case of 50,000 and I shouldn't be surprised because what we're seeing right now is the more testing that we do, the more likely we're going to get more positive tests. And we're going to see for what's been cooking for the past few days. So the effect of the lockdown is not going to take, is not going to take effect until maybe 14 days later. So I think it's very, very important um, that whatever what state you're in, and if you're not about to be on lockdown, to really do take this advice, because if you don't, you're about to go on lockdown, and it's not going to be pretty, okay? So it's very important um, to take the advice of the healthcare professionals and your governor with the mayors and all those things. And I would say, if you're not um, in any essential business, which is now food industry, grocery, and a uh, healthcare professional, I think the advantage of being in America is you have the advantage to work from home. So do please take advantage of that. You're privileged to have that in this country. So it's very important um, 
the city of Wuhan in China has been on lockdown since like January, right? They had to do this for almost three months. So we don't want to get it there. We don't want to get there. None of us, especially in New York. So it's very important. So to answer your question, why are there so many cases in New York? I think we've had the community spread and because we did not test, we're just seeing it now. And it might be the case in other places. And for the past, actually, since this morning, I've been advocating. So New York announced that they were going to go on lockdown as of Sunday. What, what happened? A lot of New Yorkers got up and left. So if these New Yorkers have the disease, whatever state they went to, right, they're also going to be spreading the disease. So if you're a New Yorker and listen to this and you've actually fled, please do stay at home for the next 14 days because you don't want to start a new cluster in other parts of the country. So um, why in New York? Why did it spread? Uh, because of the way people live, uh, people take mass, uh, take general, take transportations, which um, people are less likely to drive. And most of it is not only in New York City, it's all of the state. So um, I can't give you a specific answer, uh, but again, it's just, you know, initially, unfortunately, a lot of people have made um, comments about Chinatown and um, Little Italy coming from those areas, but it didn't. We'll, we probably won't be able to know now, but I think it's very important that um, the population living in a very close, tight knit, and the constant um, doing mass transportation and using things like train and buses, which a lot of people in New York City use, is going to put people at a higher risk of acquiring the disease. So that I would say, I think answered your questions about New York. And I just got a text from one of the, yep, I can go another 15 minutes. I can do that for the question that you guys asked. The second Great. thing about your question about Addis was, um, so I've been on the task force for the COVID response for Ethiopia since January. And because Ethiopia, um, since it was a high risk country because of the continued flight from China and um, Ethiopian Airlines being the hub of many international flights. Um, I think because of that, the ministry and the government was at a heightened um, vigilant level of awareness to ensure that we had the surveillance in place. So as of end of January or first week of February, I would say uh, airport screenings were in place uh, specifically for people that came or traveled from China. Uh, home isolation, especially around industrial park, um, the Chinese population that comes a lot from um, other parts of China were also required to uh, be on home, on home isolation for those two weeks. One thing about Wuhan and China, since it was on lockdown, there were not a lot of traffic coming from Wuhan to Ethiopia. And of course, Ethiopia did not fly to Wuhan at that point. So I think since we were at increased risk um, of getting the disease, I think the preparation and the surveillance was was really vigilant of the whole process. But I would say um, when I came back from Ethiopia about um, end of February, um, late February, like February 21st, 22nd, and I had traveled to Ethiopia and Europe at that point. And people had asked me what I traveled to, they screened my temperature at the airport. And when I landed in JFK and I flew Ethiopian Airlines, nobody even asked me where I came from. And I could have I could have flown from China to Ethiopia, from Ethiopia to US, but no. So we really started going back to the first question. We the US started the screenings very, very late. And that's one of the disadvantages because once the administration said we've closed we've closed flights to China. We all thought we were immune in the US, but people do fly through other means, right? They can go to Europe, they can go through, um, they can go through Dubai and come to the US. So I think we were a little bit ignorant on that part uh, from the US side. And the unfortunate thing is, of course, the exposure. Like we live such in a time of globalization. People could come, people could take their own private planes, right? So I think the screening and, uh, the heightened, um, the heightened surveillance and um, the risk assessment, unfortunately, in the U.S. is very poor. So in Ethiopia, I think because of the flight um, and the continuous um, commerce with China, I think that put us um, to be more vigilant and prepared. So that is one thing I would say. And 
every day we've had to uh, strategize, re-strategize based on the numbers, uh, the home isolation recommendation. So just like you said, as of this morning, we've had 11 cases and uh, we are continuing to trace the contacts of all those 11 cases, including the healthcare providers, which will continue to do so. And also, and I think um, transitioning to community tracing to see if there's been anything in the community that's been traced. And then um, when it comes to the preparation and the measures you've seen, hopefully some of you guys have seen the measures that were put um, by the prime minister as of tomorrow or as of tonight, um, any Ethiopian flight, anybody that arrives to, Ethiopian, to Ethiopia uh, is going to be required to be quarantined for 14 days, no matter where they come from. Um, it's going to be isolated at home for 14 days. And those are some of the serious measures. So about a week ago, schools were closed to decrease any chance of spreading a disease or the spread of um, any of the, um, the spread of the disease. So those were some of the measures and there's been things as encouraged or not uh, fully implemented, such as avoiding congregation, uh, cancellation of meetings, um, and to consult with the Ministry of Health before planning any meeting more than for a pop for uh, percent of greater than 50. So those are some of the measures and I can't say all the measures that were taken in the past one week, but I think uh, people do have access to Twitter and Facebook. Those actions that have been taken by the government are made publicly available. And um, also now working on increasing the capacity of the hospitals and also including the capacity of the testing and moving the testing to regional levels and also including the private sector. And those things are some of the discussions and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see it happen this week. And unfortunately, um, like everywhere else, um, we're not moving as fast as the spread of the disease. Uh, when you do work on one solution, then there's a whole bunch of other problems that open up. So it's not only that I don't think it's only the responsibility of the government. I think just like I said, for um, all of you guys that live in this country, and also I think in Ethiopia, everybody has to take everybody has to take their own responsibility and to make sure that they're not congregating in places of um, place of worship or in bars and restaurants which are also some of the things that has been taken as a measure in Ethiopia, the cancellations of bars and restaurants. Uh, but at the same time, we know that we have other non-formal gathering like Alawit, Ajrit, those things. So people still continue to go to those places that is not going to help with the interventions. So, that's so, so that is in general the interventions that has happened in Ethiopia and also to give you, give you a contrast of Ethiopia. And you know, people always ask me, um, you know, Ethiopia, um, and I, I mean, and Addis Ababa and between New York, there are a lot of similarities, um, and especially the way people live, the mass transportation, the diversity and the um, culture of being outside and being such a lively city. And I think whatever interventions that we are taking in New York, and I, I always shared my experience here in New York and the steps that are taken with different sectors, not only the health sector in Ethiopia, I think this will be very important. And I think it's very important that we do it now and that everybody takes the responsibility and have the sense of urgency to take action immediately. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you going into detail to give us a, a really good um, world. Uh, other question left on our end, but just given where we were at time-wise, we're gonna move over to Q&A. Thank you to all people who have been tuning in and sending us questions. We really appreciate it. Just to address one comment that I've been seeing, I know a lot of you are asking about why this is in English. As I mentioned earlier, we have hosted two Q&As in Amharic. We're just trying to ensure that there's variety in the language that we're using um, so that we are getting as many people as we possibly can. So. I know you've gone into details with each question that we've asked, which we really, really appreciate. Um, for the q and I'm going to group uh, a few that I believe to be are similar in nature so that you can address them. Um, and, and specifically, if there's any questions specifically people want me to address in Amharic, I can. We're gonna have yeah. also other q and A session that Absolutely. I'll tell you at the end, but uh, people specifically want me to answer in Amharic, uh, please do do that and then I can try to answer. But, uh, 
Okay. So um, again, I'm going to group questions that I feel like are similar together. So if you need me to repeat, uh, please let me know. But we are getting um, questions about, you know, young patients. I I know you mentioned it earlier, but um, are you seeing any young patients that are in critical conditions? Um, and then there are also a few people who've been asking if symptoms are different for young children. And I think another question that I think is really helpful for us to understand is, you know, you've mentioned that we are seeing a higher number of cases in the ICU for young people um, kind of all across the board. And in your opinion, is that due to any risk factor that they may have that was missed initially? Or does this speak to the nature of the virus and how it has potentially mutated to be a different version than what might have initially broken out in Wuhan? So I'm going to give just a very simple answer. Are younger patients in the US getting more sick or needing critical care than we've seen in Europe and Asia? The answer is yes. I can't tell you why yet because we don't have the data. In the next few days, as we gather more data, okay, we're gonna have the explanation. But again, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier. My personal theory is that in the US, we have a less healthier lifestyle and we are less healthier in general compared to most of the European nations. So the younger population here has more comorbidities compared to the younger patients in Europe. And I'm also going to say in Italy and in Spain, they have seen more younger patients in the ICU than China has. Okay, so this are going to change and I can't give you a definite answer, but young people are not immune from getting critically ill. But again, looking at it, what are the case fatality rates? the older patients with comorbidities are most likely to die than the younger patients who are gonna need critical care. So most of the younger patients are needing critical care, but their fatality rate or their risk of dying from the disease still much less than the older patients. So yes, people in the US that are younger are needing more critical care and higher level care, but the numbers when it comes to dying from this for the younger patients still kind of thin. So that is the answer I'm going to have. And when we have our webinar next time, and next time you see me tweet or Facebook about it, it might change. Great. And the question of the young children, most of the symptoms are very similar. We've seen some cases where if the patients have other comorbidities, like history of known seizures, they come with what we call course, quote unquote, ultimate mental status. So case by case, things are different, but the most common symptom or presentation that they would have is fever of some sort, but they might not have the very, um, very um, common you, uh, upper respiratory symptoms. So again, that's a very extreme uh, situations where they have comorbidities like cancer, immunocompromised, they have other comorbidities. Again, those are like less than 2% so far. So um, that is what I can give you right now. Um, a few questions that we're getting um, on the other, uh, on our social media lines that I think will be helpful for you to address. Um, for people who are exhibiting mild symptoms that are being recommended to stay at home and sort of treat their symptoms themselves, what recommendations do you have in terms of any prescriptions that they might take? Again, a disclaimer here that this is not a specific medical consultation. It's just kind of for collective feedback, but I know there was an article that came out recently about potential risks in taking ibuprofen. So would you recommend that people still go about treating their symptoms as if they were a cold or a flu? Or is there anything, at least based on data that we have right now, tangible data, anything that we should be mindful of or refrain from using? Okay. So um, again, if you do have mild symptoms, stay at home. If you were not going to go to the ER for the symptoms that you have, prior to the outbreak of COVID, then just do the same thing that you would do then. Um, as long as when it comes to over-the-counter medication, I think it's most of what we call as a symptomatic treatment or whatever helps you make, make you feel better. If you have your muscle aches and fever, Tylenol, acetaminophen, which are all the same things, could help. The data when it comes to ibuprofen is very limited, again, because for a good evidence of data, we, we need what we call randomized controlled trials. When it comes to the malaria drug and when it comes to the ibuprofen study, these are very small case studies, right? 
and then can be recommendations. So has ibuprofen data shown? Yes, but it's not as much. And if you do have other medical conditions like kidney disease and um, a history of allergy to aspirin or ibuprofen, you, should be, you shouldn't be taking Advil. So um, usually people, um, Tylenol is the most benign medications that do people take even during pregnancy. Uh, people do have, ibuprofen has that, uh, or Advil has that anti-inflammatory component. So for the muscle aches, for the muscle, um, for the muscle aches, ibuprofen tend to work a little bit better. So um, I would say you still can take either or because we don't have enough evidence and whatever helps you feel better at home when you do have cold symptoms, whether it's traditional or herbal things, they're not gonna be therapeutic, but whatever will make you help you feel better during this time of the mild symptoms. So it's not, we don't have a medicine, we don't have immunization yet. And again, I know that people wanna hoard the malaria drug, um, especially people in Ethiopia. Again, we don't have the evidence yet, but if we do, please do not hoard the medicine because there are people that are gonna need it. Uh, and I'll say the same thing about hand sanitizers and Lysol. Even me, when I was told that I need to check my temperature twice a day, my husband went to the pharmacy, he couldn't find a thermometer. My friend had to get it for me from yeah. when she had a spare one. So every time you take extra that you don't need, you're hoarding it for the people that really need it. So stop being selfish. <laughs> Great. A um, couple questions that I would ask you um, at the same time, because I think they both fall within the realm of pathology is that, you know, you've addressed this earlier, but at this point, is everybody who's testing positive even getting treatment or needing treatment? And I know this is a question that's being asked all across the board. For people who have gotten it and recovered, does at least based on data that we have now or stuff that we've seen so far from China, I, I believe that China has released some reports that indicate as such, but does this mean that people are going to be immune from the disease for the long term? So we don't know how long the immunity is going to last. So far, the data that we have is for several weeks. Um, and there's not that many data that showed um, reinfection. Uh, we've seen co-infections with the flu and with other uh, upper respiratory symptoms, upper, upper respiratory virals. But uh, we think that you're going to have immunity for several weeks because the antibody will stay, but the chance of reinfection, again, has not been studied so well. Again, this is still so early in the process for so many things. So um, I would say, you know, people that have gotten it and that have had it already, um, of course, the chance of them getting reinfected right away is very, very low, but those chances do exist. That's one of those things that has taught me to say, never say never. But again, based on the evidence that we have, reinfection has not been widely reported and people do have certain level of immunity, but we don't know for how long yet. Yep, great. And I think um, the consensus is for those that are testing positive, but are still not overly symptomatic or aren't showing aggressive symptoms, you know, best precaution right now is to isolate and sort of treat it as you would a cold and a flu, yeah. right? Yeah, right. and then one thing I would ask, I think maybe with that is that people that are positive without showing symptoms are the ones that really need the mask. Nobody else needs it. I know that people are holding masks everywhere, but it's been shown and it's been told many, many, many times that them having the mask does not protect you from having the disease. I said that yesterday on another webinar. If you put a mask on and somebody's coughing up in your face, those droplets can go through your eyes. If you are wearing a mask and you're touching your face, and then later on touching your mouth, you're gonna you're going to use the droplet into your mouth. So the mask is not gonna protect you. But if you feel like since you have a mask on, you're less likely gonna to touch your face, do it. But the mask is not gonna protect you. I think a lot of people should understand. They ask me, what kind of mask should I wear? How should I cover my face, my eyes? Really, the people that need the mask are the people that have the symptoms, or that are taking care of patients that have the symptoms, or that are healthcare professionals. So please do spread this message to all your family members. Great. Um, another question that um, we have been getting, and I think it falls great in line with your role in terms of the efforts that are being led in Ethiopia is, what can those of us who are not based in Ethiopia are dispersed globally, but are of course very passionate about everything that's going on in our country, what can we do to aid the fight that the Ministry of Health is um, undertaking and has been for the past few weeks to address this pandemic? Okay. 
So, I mean, I might be biased when I say that I think the Ministry of Health the past few weeks, what they've done is um, commendable and all the actions taken, especially in regards to what I've said uh, about the airport screening. Ethiopia started a lot earlier than a lot of the other countries. Um, and of course, um, Ethiopia being a lower income country, the, the most of the challenges are going to be more um, harder to get through or to address right away compared to the resources like we have in America or in Europe. So as a country and as a government, you've seen some of the interventions that was released yesterday, which are cutting out flights, uh, getting people to be isolated inside a hotel, um, getting the equipment that are necessary for the testing and for the protection of the healthcare workers, the closure of schools, um, trying to get all, health of, all officials to avoid any mass gatherings, congregations, meetings. So those are the things, but rules and regulations are nothing if people are not following them and the government is not enforcing them, okay? So I'm gonna say this as, even if you, there was this regulations didn't come out, even if this rules or um, this requirements were not in place, I think these are the things that people can do at home to protect the spread of the disease. If you have family members and friends who are still hanging out outside at a restaurant, at bars, hopefully not anymore because most of the places would be closed, or even going to the gym, they shouldn't be doing that. They should really stay home, especially the ones that are able to, right? Um, people, unfortunately, unlike we have and we see here, people can't work from home. So what is it that you can advise them while they go around their um, daily routine that you can get them to do is about the use of teaching them about things that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> Excuse me, hope it's not COVID. Uh, uh, but- Bless you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but I think it's very, very important that you do your calls, that you're sharing these messages with them, that you're advising them, and that they don't panic. So it's very, very important that you do your advocacy and you help with reducing the panic and that you share the right information and you prevent the infodemic, especially, I hate to say this, those of us in the US have the advantage of being on the internet on Facebook and Twitter and just attacking and becoming the Facebook warrior that we don't need to be. So on those messages, just share the right information. Um, it's not about spreading rumors or really speaking against the politicians at this point. You really have to be supportive of your healthcare officials and everybody who's trying their best. It's very important for every individual to be informed and to take the necessary actions and they do prevent. So in that way, they prevent the spread of the disease all over the country. Great. Um, we are getting a lot of questions about different prescription drugs, some unfortunately that I can't even pronounce. So if you could just spend a minute and talking about some of the drugs that have been in the headlines recently, whether they're being used in other countries, whether um, they're being used in trials here, as you mentioned, there needs to be a process of randomized trials to determine efficiency of these prescription medications. But I know we had someone that asked about um, using z and that potentially being related to arrhythmia in elder pa elderly patients. Again, these aren't really things that we can go through in such a short span of time right now, but wanted to give you, you know, 30 seconds or a minute to give a high level commentary on prescription drugs that could be used as either vaccinations or treatments for COVID? Okay. Um, I think I'm going to say this because I really don't care this way, but azithromycin and the recommendations that Trump tweeted yesterday was a complete fallacy at this point. And Anthony Fauci, who was the NIH director, has said it. We have such a small data on the combination of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is the med the chloroquine is a medication that's widely used in America. I mean, in um, for malaria in Africa. And somebody even said that uh, I got a text earlier. Oh, do you think there are not that many cases in Africa because a lot of them are on hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for malaria? The answer is an absolute no at this point. That's because we don't have enough evidence to show that 
the hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin. This is all anecdotes, small studies, 12 patients that they've seen. What are the chances? It's like flipping a coin. So based on this, we don't have the data. Right now, there's a randomized controlled trial in the US and in Europe occurring. So in the next few days, the next few weeks, we might have some of the data that's supporting it. So the use of the antimalaria and the azithromycin, this medications right now for COVID has not been validated yet. So we can't say that yet for sure. And of course, if patients have pneumonia and they're getting azithromycin and then later on uh, for, because what that's the first thing that we use for atypical pneumonia or walking pneumonia and patients do have COVID and they, you know, they eventually do better because they're taking azithromycin. It might be the underlying pneumonia that you treated. So I think there's a lot of panic and there's a lot of um, uh, information without enough data that are um, disseminating. And as your doctors, you don't want us to use medications that have not been widely validated because sometimes, and most of the time, they can cause more harm than benefit to the patients and the general population. Great. And before we move on to our last question, because I know we've passed, we're almost at the 20 minute mark right now. Um, a lot of people have been agreeing with um, the piece of advice that you've been giving about, you know, who needs to wear masks and other precautions that we need to be taking. Because they're especially important to people in Ethiopia, do you mind just reiterating your points in Amharic specifically with regards to washing hands and wearing a mask? I think that would be helpful. Okay. And then we could move on to okay. our last question. Okay. Uh, somebody just texted me from one of my colleagues also who's... Um, uh, who is also telling me about to comment on the azithromycin and the plaquenil. So one of the things I said earlier was about the medications, um, and I'll answer your questions also in Amharic, but some of the medications that they've asked about, they will, uh, which is what I said at the end, that the benefits of using this medication um, have not been proven yet, but also the harms of this using this medications could be worse. Hello, Sanafuk, I think your screen froze. Uh, can people still see me? Hello. Okay, I'm just gonna call my. Uh... Hello, Sanaf. Okay. I think it froze. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I can hear you now. I think. Okay. Back so I'm on. gonna go back to what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. So I was saying on the question of the zitro. Okay. The azithromycin and. Uh, Okay, I can see you now. Okay, um, so the on the question of azithromycin and plaquenil, I just want to make sure that I tell you guys, um, I tell everybody that in addition to not having enough evidence, this medicines could have serious side effects. They do cause what we call arrhythmia, which is um, an abnormal uh, beat to your heart, leading to um, having a cardiac arrest, or they also could lead to what we call cardiotoxicity. And this, people are calling doctors and asking for a prescription for this medication. So please, let's not do that now, because it could have serious consequences to many. And when we do have the evidence for randomized controlled trials, that may show the benefits of this medicine is very important, that we give it to the people that need it the most. So again, it goes back to my statement that I said earlier, please do not hoard the medicines from the people that might not, that might need it. And again, don't use it unless you need it because the consequences could be more to you than actually the benefits of it. So, ለሰዎችም <laughs> But for Chachu Mahana, but after Chachu Mahakalana, after the mood, after Chachu, better matter, Kohalam, better matter, see Kazidras, better matter, less a second, better Jachi Yashashan, a Yashan, Kazabo Hamata, one non a Gerahino. 
ሁለተኛ ነገር ለ60 ሰከንድ በየተቻለ መጠን መታጠብ ካልተቻለ በሃንድ ሳኒታይዘር አልኮሆል 60% አልኮሆል ባለው የሃንድ ሳኒታይዘር ለ20 ሰከንድ እጆቻችን ላይ እነኚህ ሳኒታይዘሮች ማድረግ ነው ሶስተኛ ነገር ፊታችንንና አይናችንን ለአለመንካት መሞከር አለመንካት ከነካንም ወደ አውሮጃችን መታጠብ በተቻለ መጠን እንደዚህ የጅና ለመንካትና ፍታስ ለመታጠብ እጅና ለመንካትን ጥፍታቻ ለመንካትና አይኖቻችን ካለካን ይሄን በሽታ ለመቋጠር እንቻለን ከነካንም በተቻለ መጠን እጃችን መታጠብ እና ሃንድ ሳኒታይዘር መጠቀም ሶስተኛ ቀድም ያነሳው ደግሞ አሁን ሶሻል ዲስታንሲንግ መራራቀን የሚባለው ነገር በሁለት ሜትር ወበዚያ ጋር ደግሞ 6 ፊት ባለ ርቀት ውስጥ ከሰው ጋር አለመሆን ከዛ ካነሰ ባነሰ ርቀት ውስጥ ነው በተቻለ መጠን ከቤት መስራት ከቤት መስራት ማለት ቤት ሆኖ ለብቻ በኮምፒውተር ወይ ደግሞ ሚጻፈና ሚነበቡ ካለች ከቤት መስራት ውጪ ዓለም ወጣት በተቻለ መጠን ላስፔዛና በጣም ለሚያስፈልጉ ነገሮች ካመነ በስተቀር ከቤትም ከወጣን እጃችንን መታጠብና ሃንድ ሳኒታይዘር በተለይ ደግሞ ምንም አይነት ሰርፌሶችን ከነካል በሮች ከነካን በርስን ከፍት የበር መያዣ ከከፈተን የተለያዩ ካውንተሮች ላይ ግሮሰሪስ እንገዛ የተለያዩ ነገሮች ለምንነካ በተለይ ብዙ ህዝብ ያለበት አካባቢ ከሆነ እንደዚህ አይነት ጊዜ እጃችንን በደም መታጠብ በተቻለ መጠን ደግሞ ሃንድ ሳኒታይዘር በሽታ ምታልፈው በተንፋሽ ሳይሆን በመናወራበት ጊዜ ባፋችን ከመይወጡ ነገሮች ናቸው እነዚህ ነገሮች ባይናይ ታዩ ከኔ ፍለፊት ያለ ሰው በሁለት በሁለት ሜትር ዲስታንስ በታች ከሆነ ከመዋራቸው በካፌ በሚወጡ ድሮፕሎች ወይ የመረቅተ ንሻካሎች ሌላ ሰው ላይ ስፍሬ ሊያረግ ይችላል ስለዚህ እሱ ነው ዋና ነገር መቆጣጣር ባይናችን የማይታዩ እነኚህ ነገሮችን እኛ ላይ እንዳያርፉ ማድረግ ነው እና አሁን በተለይ ደግሞ ለኛ ሀገር የሚያስቸግረው በኛ ሀገር ካቻ አሁን ደግሞ ጾም እንደሆነ ነው ቤተክርስቲያን አለመሄድን ነውና ቤተክርስቲያንን የተለያዩ ፕሮግራሞችን እንግዲህ ቤት በመሆንና በተለያዩ በሚዲያዎች በዩቲዩብ ሆኖ አንድ ላይ የመጸለይ መንፈስንን መፍጠር እንችላለን ስለዚህ እነኚህ እነኚህ ነገሮችን አገር ለቡና ለመጠጣትም ለምን ለመገናኘት መገናኘት በጣም እንፈልግ ሰዎች አለ ግን አሁን በዚህ ጊዜ በጣም ትግስተኛ ሆነ ይሄን በሽታ በተቻለ መጠን ሳይስፋፋ ጊዜው እንዲያልፈልን ነው እና በጣም ያስቸግር ጊዜ ነው ብዙ አግሮች እንደቀለጹት ደግሞ ይሄ ኦልሞስት እንደ ከጦርነት ሁሉ እንደታየው ጀርመኖች ከሁለተኛንም ጦርነት በኋላ እንደዚህ አይነት ችግር ነው የመጣብን ብለው የጀርመን ፕሬዝዳንት ተናግራለችና አይ ቲንክ ይሄን ነገር ሁሉም ሁሉም ነገር አልፋ ብለን ተስፋ እናረጋለን እንግዲህ በጸሎትም ሁሉም በኩል ሳይገዘናል ግን የራሳችን ደግሞ በየግለሰ ደግሞ ማደጋ ያለብን ነገሮች አሉና ነኝ 3 4 ነገሮች ካረጋ ግን አይ ቲንክ የዚህ የበሽታ መስፋፋት ይቀንሳል ማስክ ደግሞ መጠቀም ያለበት በሽታው ያለበት ሰው ነው አብዛኛው በሽታው ያለበት ሰው ሲያስል ሲያወራ ሲተነፈስ ከአፉ እነኚህ ነገሮች እንዳወጡ ነው ወደ ሌላ ሰው እንዳይሄድ ነው ማስክ ማድረግ ብቻው በሽታውን አይከለክልም ማስክ አድርጎ እጃ ለመታጠብና ፊት መንካት በሽታውን ያስተላልፋል ስለዚህ ማስኩ ማድረጉን የሰው ሁሉ አፍላጎት ነው በሰዓት ይገባኛል ማህረብ በጨርቅ የሚያደርገ ነው መቃውም ሰማ እሱን ካደረገ ግን እነኚህ አውራዎችን ሁለቱም እጅ መታጠብና ፊት መንካትን አንድ ላይ ማድረግ አለብን በሽታ እንዳይተላለፍ ለማድረግና በዚህ በዚህ በኩል እዚህ ሀገሩ እዚህ ሀገር ውስጥ ያሉት ሰዎች ማስተማር አገር ውስጥ ያሉት ሰዎች ደግሞ እንደዚህ አይነት ነገር ማስተማርና በተቻለ መጠን ደግሞ ሰው በድንጋጤና በፈራት መልኩ ሳይሆን በደም በተማርና በደም ደግሞ መረጃ ባለው በኩል በደዘይት በኩል ሰው የሚያስፈልገው እርምጃ በግለሰብነት በግለሰብም ወይ በሰራ በኩል እንደዚህ ነገር ነገሮች ቢወሰዱ ጥሩ ይመስለኛል በመንግስት ወኩ ያሉት ነገሮች አሉ ግን እንደ ይግለሰብ ደግሞ ሁሉም ሞሰድ ያለበት ሪስፖንሲቢሊቲ ያለ በሱ በሱ ወኩል ማድረግ እንግዲህ የሀገራችን እንዳይስፋፋ እዚህ አሜሪካ ውስጥ እንዳይስፋፋ ማድረግ ይችላል የመጨረሻን ጥያቄ በአማርኛ ስለመለሽልን እና መሰግናለን ጽዮን ቴንክ ዩ አይቭ ቢን ሞኒተሪንግ አ ላት ኦፍ ዘ ኳስቲንስ ዘት ዊቭ ቢን ጌቲንግ ኦን ሶሻል ሚዲያ ቢት ራይት ናው አይ ኖ ዊ አር አውት ኦፍ ታይም ሶ አይ ቲንክ ዘ ላስት ኳስቲን ዘት አይ ዋንት ቱ አስክ ዩ ኢዝ ኢን ቴርምስ ኦፍ ዩቲላይዚንግ ሶሻል ሚዲያ አይ ኖ ዩቭ ቢን ቬሪ አክቲቭ ኦን ትዊተር ዉድ ዩ ሴይ ዘት ኢትስ ፕሩቨን ቱ ቢ አ ጉድ ቱል ኢን ቴርምስ ኦፍ ጊቪንግ ዩ አክሰስ ቱ ሄልዝ ኬር ወርከርስ ዘት አር አት ዘ ፎርፍሮንት ኦፍ ዘ ስፋይት ኢን አዘር ካንትሪስ ኢን ዋት ዱ ዩ ቲንክ ዊ can do moving forward to ensure that this is an aid in our fight and not a hindrance um i think just like i said make sure that the people that you follow are credible that they know what they're talking about 
and I'm going to say this outright, uh, even healthcare professionals have been disseminating wrong information sometimes. So it's very important to at least check, even for me, right? Every time I look at one thing and somebody says it, no matter how well I know and I trust the person, I always look for other resources. So I think it's very important that you double check, you triple check your information before you analyze it and move into action. And that you take, um, you especially when it comes to Ethiopia, you do take the information from reliable sources, from the government official, from the ministry's Facebook page or Twitter page, or from the minister's Facebook page and Twitter page, and the same thing for the PM. So I think it's very important that you acquire information uh, about Ethiopia from the right people, from the right institutions, and also that uh, when you retweet or when you like things, I think it's very important that uh, you are doing it for the people that really matter and that have also the right information and disseminate the right information. Um, I do tweet a lot, I think, and now also not only me talking, but also me getting information from uh, people at the forefront, from Italy, from Germany. And whenever I have a question, I just tweet. I'm like, hey guys, people in Germany, what are you guys doing so well that you haven't had this much debt? Or what are the public health intervention? Me as a public health professional and as also a medical professional, I'm constantly looking for information that helps both ways. When I'm there at the very forefront, at the front of a patient, I'm thinking, what is going to help this patient? My question is like, what am I going to do that is not going to, what's going to help the patient from dying? And is it going to be safe for me to send this home, this patient home? Or what are the risk factors? What are the reasons I need to bring this patient to the hospital? So those are the things that I am constantly thinking about when I'm in front of a patient. But when I'm not in front of a patient, then um, talking about policy work and public health intervention, uh, me constantly looking for information from WHO and from other ministry pages to find out uh, what intervention has worked for them and to inform the general public about around it. So it's very important um, this time we have one enemy to know that we only have one enemy and that we wage a war against this enemy and we all unite um, against it, no matter of what race, uh, what um, color of our skin is gonna affect everybody. And we all have to think like we have the disease and that we are at risk of exposing other people and that we wash our hand and that we apply hand sanitizers, we don't touch faces and we try to maintain social distancing. Tanafak, I think you're disconnected again. I I'm seeing that I'm still live. Um, Sinafik is not around to close it. So I'm going to call Shumelis so he can tell me what he tells me to do. I think she's having connection issues. In the meantime, I'm just going to make another announcement that um, tomorrow at noon, 12 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we're going to have another webinar about social distancing. So, hi, Shamalis, can you still see me? Am I still live? Okay, so I should, I should not because I connect this, so I should close it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, uh, one of the YEP uh, organizers are going to come and close it, they don't want me to close it. Uh, but I'm going to make an announcement that tomorrow um, through YEP and other modalities, I'm going to give a presentation on um, on social distancing, which will be at noon Eastern time. And it's going to be, I picked that time so people in Ethiopia could join in. And it's going to be a social distancing lecture and uh, about some of the things that if you own a company or an institution, what are the things that you can do at your workplace to uh, intervene? And also what are the things that you can teach others about social distancing? Because it's a new concept for a lot of people. And it's also um, a time of a lot of change. We're trying to adapt it. I'm always an optimistic about so many things on life. And I think um, the worst part is gonna hit, whether here or Ethiopia, and it's about the, it's about what you do as an individual. I think, especially you being in this country, you do have an immense amount of power and privilege that a lot of people in Ethiopia may not have. So it's really about informing people. And one thing, there's a lot of fire bubbling everywhere. Um, 
I would say it helps by um, not adding fuel to the fire. A small amount of water will do. So it's very, very important that you all as an individual are the piece of the water into the, fi into the fire. And at some point, whether it might last a week, a month, two months, three months, four months, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but that we continue to do so. And it's very, very important that, um, hold on, I think South Africa's joining. It's very important that we continue to do so. Um, let me see if I can get South Africa back. South Africa, I can't see you, but I am receiving your chats. I can't hear you either. Okay. South Africa, okay. Um, now I can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Yeah, but I can see me. You, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've said everything I needed to say. Maybe you guys should close it. Great. No. Um, so if you can hear me clearly, apologies for the technical difficulty. I think my um, internet got disconnected. Okay. Um, let no, me... I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, you can see me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've said everything I needed to say. Maybe you guys should close it. Great. Okay. Um, now I'm just hearing myself. Okay. I know. Whoever's on the... Yep, network. I think we need to mute them. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I think let I think Shim is probably trying to give me a okay. hosting access. So let me let's give him thirty seconds. Great. Okay. Now I'm just hearing myself. Hey, Shime, can you mute one of it? Okay, we are back. <laughs> <laughs> back great to see you okay well i appreciate you addressing or continuing to address the questions as i got disconnected apologies for the technical difficulty everyone technology is great when it works um anyways it's okay that's the purpose of being an emergency physician you always compromise <laughs> right right um well on, on behalf of yep and everybody who's tuned in and everybody who's going to be watching this video li later um thank you so so much for your time you made yourself available accessible on such short notice and were detailed and very clear with every question that was asked so thank you so so much um any closing remarks i know you went into detail when I was disconnected, but if you could just spend the last 30 seconds kind of giving a message of hopefully hope and unity to everybody that's watching and anything that we could do to be a resource for one another. Um, and again, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And to everybody that's tuning in, we hope you got value out of this Q&A. We'll be sure to host more sessions in Amharic and other languages if possible as well. Definitely send us feedback because we want this to be something that's helpful for you and something that you can use as a resource. And I'll give the last 30 minutes to Zion to say anything that you feel 30 like. 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, did I say 30 minutes? <laughs> Difficult time for a lot of us to adjust when we're being told to stay at home, change a lot of behaviors that we're not used to do it. But think of it that you're part of the solution because if you don't take this measure, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And the time is going to reach the peak is going to take a lot longer, right? So it means that the whole of the world, especially the U.S., with the U.S. right now, it's like a ticking bomb. I'm sorry to say this, but in the next few weeks, we're going to see the worst number of cases. So before we get there or to worsen the amount of the peak, right, there's a whole thing about what we call flatten the curve. It's all about dealing with the things that I just told you, staying at home, washing your hands, not touching your face and not touching your eyes. And that's going to help flatten the curve. So in that way, the, net, the spread of the disease will decrease and stay calm. Don't panic. It's going to pass no matter how long it's going to pass. This is not a war amongst each other. This is a war against the disease and we have one common enemy. We can do it. Just like I said earlier, there's a lots of fire bubbling everywhere. Be part of um, the solution by adding water to set the fire. Do not add fuel to the fire by causing lots of fear and panic and use social media and all the media outlets very responsibly. And also uh, find new ways to entertain yourself, to entertain each other, to check up on 
others because that's where solidarity comes and that's how we really could unite to overcome this times to overcome um, all the challenges that we're facing right now. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for everybody who tuned in. Apologies again for the technical difficulties. Um, follow Dr. Zion on social media. She's very active on Twitter and is always posting very helpful, relevant information. Um, follow us on social media as well as we're planning to host many, many more sessions with members of our community who are at the forefront of this fight. Good night, everyone, and thank, thank you. you. And then one more thing, I'm just going to say again, the social distancing webinar we're going to have it tomorrow. It's going to be hosted through YEP. Thank you guys for hosting it. So that way you guys, um, I don't have to worry about arranging the Zoom and the live session. So we'll send details, but it will be Monday, March 23rd at 12 or noon Eastern Standard Time. It will be a lecture about social distancing and what people can do individually to take on social distancing either at their institutions or at whatever they work and some of the measures that they can do whether it's small or big interventions that could stop the spread of the disease. And that time was picked again because it's going to be evening time in Ethiopia so everybody from all over the world can tune in. So thank you guys. Great, thank you Zion. Bye.